Um, you find the persons to be heard thing? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I call the City Council meeting to order for September 15th, 2014 at 7 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Some introductions here. To my left is Council Members Mark Vanderlindy, Arlene Donahue, Bob Christians, and Tyler Avens, and our City Engineer from WSB, Paul Hornby, is at the end. To my right is our Interim City Administrator, Mike Baroni, our Finance Director, Brian Grimm, our Community Development Director, David Abel, our City Attorney, Ron Beatty, and our Director of Public Safety, Paul Falls. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, subtractions? I think we already made changes. Um, this counts as the we didn't really change it, but we did get the additional information on Enchanted. Um, but any additions? Do I, do I, I'd like to add something on the business items. Can we, do we do that now or do we do that later? No, you would do that now. What would you like to discuss? You know, I, I'm. Uh, I would like under the business items to discuss the mayor's term. Oh. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, in talking to other cities, mm -hmm. all the other cities, St. Bonnie, Mound, all the other ones have a two-year term versus a four-year term. Mm -hmm. And we're one of the few cities that have a four-year term versus a two-year term. And I think it would be beneficial overall. I think it would be... Can you talk into the mic, Bob? So I, <coughs> I think it would be beneficial uh kind of keep uh, everybody more on the toes and more alert to what's happening in the community i think there's some things that have happened in the past that uh, maybe uh, uh, could have had better attention of things that have happened in the past i and again the other surrounding cities are doing too so i, I don't why are we doing four i'd like to put it on for discussion okay so you want to put it under f <coughs> under business items e. E. no e is king point road assessments no, the, you didn't get the update. She passed around a new one. Okay. Okay. So it's essentially what I have. Okay. So Thank that you. will be number E or letter yep, E. That would be easy. And that'll be the mayoral term. Okay. So we'll add that. Okay. Can I have a motion for the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five all. Okay. At this point in our meeting, is the persons to be heard? Oh, we don't have any persons to be heard this evening. Oh, that's a change. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's move on to special. This could be a whirlwind meeting. Uh, let's move on to special presentations. Our thrilling and exciting roundabout video. Paul, do you want to introduce it while we kind of queue it up here? Sure. Um, this in at the last meeting we did talk about um, you know some of the issues we're having with the roundabout up at uh, Kings Point Road and Trunk Highway Seven. So we want to try to find a video perhaps to use as an educational tool tool that would be on the city's website um, and one that was specific to multi-lane roundabouts. That's probably one of the more unique things about this roundabout versus some of the others that are on Highway Seven and um, driving them may. Uh, be a bit confusing at times uh, versus a single lane. And um, I think uh, Council Member Vanderlinde had a very good point at the last meeting too where he had mentioned driving large trucks through the, through the multi-lane roundabouts and the technique and what he had described he did is exactly what he should be doing is just you, you take and you straddle the line so you actually take up both lanes uh, on the approach and into the roundabout uh, so you can maneuver in them. And cars are not are supposed to yield to those larger trucks. so. This um, video is one that looks at not only things, you know, how to drive a roundabout. <coughs> now, Brian and I were working on this, but my guess is it also shows you what not to do in the roundabout. Should we dim the lights? Important <laughs> concepts of a roundabout is the yield principle. All vehicles must yield to traffic inside the roundabout, as well as vehicles exiting. 
Drivers should only enter after sufficient space is available to maneuver safely into the roundabout. Defensive driving is appropriate in all situations. Make sure you are aware of other vehicles within the roundabout and be alert to drivers entering and exiting. When approaching a multi-lane roundabout, drivers must choose either the left or right lane before entering. The appropriate lane choice is based on the driver's desired exit or intended destination. For the multi-lane roundabout shown in this video, the left lane allows left turns, straight ahead movements, and U-turns only. Allowable right lane maneuvers include immediate right turns or straight ahead movements. In all cases, signs will direct drivers to the proper lane. Drivers using the left lane have the following options. Left turns, straight ahead movements, and U-turns. Remember, when driving in the left lane, always maintain your lane position until you exit. Vehicles using the right lane must make an immediate right turn or a straight ahead movement. Remember to maintain your lane position until you exit. For a roundabout to function properly, everyone must follow the rules of the road. As you are about to see, Failure to observe these rules will create unsafe conditions for you and other drivers. Before entering, always yield to traffic within the roundabout. Entering without sufficient space will cause an unsafe condition. In this situation, the vehicle in the right lane cuts off the driver in the left lane intending to exit. Be aware of other vehicles in the lane next to you. They may be unaware of your intended exit never change lanes while inside the roundabout. This car in the outside lane is attempting an improper U-turn. U-turns are only allowed in the left lane. Some roundabouts are specifically built with truck aprons to accommodate the turning radius of large trucks and trailers. Although truck aprons are provided, drivers should be aware that trucks may straddle both lanes. That is why it is important to never drive adjacent to or past trucks while maneuvering through a roundabout. If you follow a truck into a roundabout, do not attempt to pass. When emergency vehicles approach, always give them the right of way. If you have not yet entered the roundabout, pull over to the right, allowing emergency vehicles to pass. Never stop while inside the roundabout. Instead, continue to your exit, then pull over to the right shoulder of the roadway, allowing emergency vehicles to maneuver around you A roundabout crosswalk functions the same as an unsignalized crosswalk. Before entering the crosswalk, pedestrians should always look in the direction of oncoming traffic, find a gap in traffic, and then cross. Although you have the right of way, forcing traffic to stop suddenly can create unsafe conditions for both you and the drivers entering or exiting the roundabout. Most roundabouts include refuge islands, providing pedestrians with a safe route across opposing travel lanes. Bicyclists are encouraged to use crosswalks by walking their bikes. Only experienced bicyclists should ride through the roundabout. If you choose to enter a roundabout, the same rules of the road apply for a bike as an automobile. Now let's review the key points. As you approach a modern roundabout, remember these basic principles. 
yield principle. Yielding to all traffic circulating within the roundabout before entering is the single most important rule. Lane choice. Drivers must make the appropriate lane choices based on their destination before driving through the roundabout. After you enter the roundabout, never overtake other vehicles or change lanes. Slow down. Modern roundabouts are designed for speeds of 20 miles an hour or less. Drivers should be aware of the posted speed limit signs and slow down to safely enter. Large trucks and trailers. Give special consideration to large trucks and trailers. Never pass or drive adjacent to a truck within a roundabout. Driving behind large trucks is preferred. Emergency vehicles. Do not impede emergency vehicles. Pull over to the right if you are not in the roundabout or move through and exit the roundabout to ensure emergency personnel get to their intended destination without undue delay. Pedestrians. Utilize the modern roundabout's refuge island. This allows pedestrians to cross both directions of traffic safely. Bicyclists. Bicyclists should use the pedestrian crosswalk. Only experienced bicyclists should ride through the roundabout. Following these rules of the road will help you drive through a modern roundabout correctly and safely. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Were we still talking about restriping or not? At this point, um, I did talk to our design engineer, um, and he has worked with MnDOT extensively, not only this roundabout, but others. So this one has some, some unique characteristics to it. But um, before they would consider restriping, um, MnDOT wants to see how these are going to perform. It's probably a little too soon to do that. Okay. And I know at the last meeting there was some discussion about some of the frustrations that um, people have heard of or experienced within the roundabout. I think from MnDOT's standpoint, I can't speak for them, but it's my opinion that they're going to want us to wait a little longer after talking to our designer on them to see how they happen operationally. Oftentimes MnDOT will look at incidents such as crashes. Are there more crashes or fewer crashes? Um, and they'll look at that as one factor. Now the one thing with this roundabout is we don't have pedestrians on the surface. That's at least a positive with that one. So. Yep. Okay, any other questions about the roundabout? Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe Brian is up. Mike. Yeah, and I'm going to just make a few comments before Brian actually kind of dives into the uh, budget presentation. Um, as you know, tonight we're going to pr pass a uh, preliminary levy to, in order to meet the county deadline of September 30th. Um, and then uh, slated for tonight is a general fund increase of 4.1%. So we thank the council for these uh, increases. Um, I won't really go back and discuss uh, previous budgets, previous years, but what I am encouraged about is uh, overall that you know, our economy has been improving in the last year or two. Uh, the city is growing and then home value prices are trending up. So uh, this will all help uh, impact, uh, lessen the impact of our, our budget increase uh, going forward in 2015. Um, staff has held about eight budget meetings as we sat down and tried to shape the 2015 budget and then council of staff have had some very honest and open discussions in the past few months at our special meetings in order to uh, uh, discuss the 2015 budget. Um, there's still a lot more work to be done in future years. Uh, we have many needs in roads and utilities and other demands that go along with being a uh, growing city. Uh, but just, uh, this is council probably already knows, but so the public knows that uh, city staff is committed to uh, being effective and efficient with our tax dollars. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Brian and he can kind of go through the uh, budget presentation for 2015. Brian? Sure. Thanks, Mike. I'm Madam Mayor Council. The one thing I just wanted to clarify, I think, um, is the 4.1% uh, the that um, Mike referenced. That is our, our preliminary total tax levy Correct. increase. That would be the uh, you know capital, roads, general fund, operations, everything together. So um, just wanted to make that clarification. Um, as I guess Mike's already stated here, um, we have to uh, certify the preliminary levy by uh, Tuesday, September 30th. So that's what we're looking to take action on tonight. Um, uh, our 2015 budget goals that um, we've sort of tried to stay honed in on is, you know, obviously the, the first one is to ensure the city's financial stability. I think we've done a really good job over the past 
several years. I mean, or, you know, as, as far as making sure we have healthy fund balances and and um, balancing um, our, our needs there, um, addressing capital Im improvement um, needs, and, and just making sure our, our capital improvements being met. I think this this budget uh, does that. Um, you know, every year we look at our, our, our staffing and benefit lev levels in conjunction with our service levels to make sure that um, um, we're, we're doing good there. And one of the things that um, is outlined in the memo is the, uh, the mid-year um, add back of the, the lieutenant position, the police lieutenant position, and then the uh, funding the pavement management plan, which is important, I think, to, to all of us. So, um, so basically what the PowerPoint's doing here is summarizing this was some um, pages, you know, 4 through 15 of, of the... Uh, of the packet. Um, here is the, uh, you know, and council, I know you've seen these slides, you know, a lot of this is for the, uh, the public at, at home here. <coughs> but um, you can see our, our previous uh, couple of years, few years from 2012 to 2014, our, our, our levy has stayed uh, flat. Um, what uh, the changes in 2015 are um, basically uh, the debt uh, fund levy is going up to, to fund some equipment purchases for through an equipment certificate. And then the other um, major change is 100000 for additional road maintenance, trying to phase in, and, and I'll talk about that a little later, our, our, our pavement management plan. So um, those are the, the two main changes. And, and what the, um, basically the bottom line is that the total net levy is uh, at $3,935,000 once the fiscal disparities of 101000 is taken off. So uh, I believe that number is actually still, I mean, I, we show the trend later, but it's, it's lower than 2010. I think it's even... I think Lower it's down to 2006. Six, yeah, I think this tax will be at yeah, it's either 06 or 07. Yeah, as far as yeah. right around that that time it's frame. It's between them. Yep, yep. And um, yeah, here's just a uh, I guess a, a graph that shows the last you know back to 2009, and that was uh, when our our tax levy was at I, for lack of a better term, I guess the highest point. Or so you can see we've um, just as we just talked about, you know, even by uh, going back to right around four million, we're still. You know, six hundred thousand or so lower than we were in two thousand nine. So I think the the city's done a very good job of um, doing that, but knowing that we need to um, invest in a, in a few things this year and make just a uh, what I would call a, a reasonable levy increase. In conjunction with that, our, our our general fund is our biggest share of our expenditures, and uh, that still is below you know pre two thousand nine levels as far as um, our general fund. Uh, back then was a little over 4.5 million, and we're we're still below that as far as our, you know, spending on our, our police and our streets and all those you know general fund activities that um, you know are our main core services we provide. Uh, this goes back into um, this is from our last audit, you know, so it's through 2013, and it um, shows that we've been in that 50 to 60 percent range as far as what's called our general fund fund balance reserve. So. Um, State Auto recommends being between 35 and 50 percent, so we're actually a little above that. Which I mean, so we do have a you know a healthy fund balance and um, able to we've been able to you know use allocate that for some different things as far as some additional roads or not having to levy for some you know equipment in, in, in years past. So we've we've done that and I think we've um, been judicious with that. So um, here's um, our CIP, and you can see. Um, I think we're going to spend a little, um, as far as our capital purchases for like, you know, trucks for public works and, and police squads and such. So we're budgeted to spend about 370000 in 2015 here. Um, some of these other uh, amounts obviously are per the plan for 2015 and 19 will be looked at each year as far as some need. Um, you can see it's ebbed and flowed a little bit. When the economy was um, a little slower, we tried to um, cut back a little bit and just, you know, just like you know, everyone did, I guess. So um, we're just uh, looking at... Uh, making some investments in our equipment again just to make sure we stay on that proper re replacement schedule. Uh, phase into the pavement management plan, what we're trying to do is get to this 900000 here in 2019. Right now we spend about 350000 as of 2014 on our pavement ma management plan. So we're, what we're doing in that, that ties into that levy sheet I was showing earlier as far as um, trying to up that about 100000 each of the next um, Few years, and then even 125,000 after that, and I think um, that's a prudent way to, to get to where we need to be. And we also have some MSA uh, municipal state aid dollars we get, so we just have to balance tax levy dollars with other um, financing sources, such as state dollars, to uh, make sure we're staying on top of our roads. Here's, uh, I guess, in 
almost taking the previous slides and, and summarizing it into one slide as far as, as our tax levy, you can see as um, it went down from 2010 and stayed the same, and now there's that you know, basically about 4% increase up in them. One thing I know Mike touched on it earlier, of that 4% increase, roughly about half, you know, or, or close to 2% is almost um, made up of capturing our growth, or our new homes within the city. So really you're not, existing homeowners shouldn't see it, you know, that full 4%, it should be something closer to, you know, if they had a, the, the median valuation increase, should be something closer to two. So I just wanted to point that out. But this just shows um, also our, um, you know, reserves. We've, we've been able to use some of our reserves to keep our tax levy, uh, you know, manageable or, you know, reasonable and, and um, but um, also then keep our, um, our fund balance percentage knowing that, you know, there's, um, we want to not just have that keep building and building. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance between all of those items and I think we've done a good job of um, maintaining that balance. This, trend, I think this is a very important graph. Um, as far as what people were paying in, in property taxes in 2010, I mean, this is taking a property that was valued at 500,000 in 2010, and we know that property <coughs> experienced some valuation decreases. I mean, that was just the way, um, you know, the housing market was going, so. But we also did decrease our, our tax levy during those times, so you can see that that property owner, even with the, um, you know, the, the slight increase for the 2015 is, is basically paying $175 less than what they were paying in 2010. So um, obviously uh, that five-year trend, most you know, more people have uh, more money in their pockets or have paid less for city taxes based on um, what the city's um, done, made, you know, done the last several years. This is just more of a year-to-year -year trend. What, what people, what the residential properties are seeing when, with working with the county um, assessor's office, the, the average uh, Valuation increases about 5.5 percent. So, if they have that valuation increase, and with the uh, the tax levy that is proposed, you can see their value will go up between 2014 and 15. And then here's the respective tax amounts page. So you can see it's, you know, for the $350,000 property, you know, it's basically a difference of what you know they'll see a $22 in increase on their their property taxes. You know, less than $2 a month. So. That slide just shows it with a little, if you have more of a larger increase, but I mean, that's just the way the, the property tax formula works. Um, some of our main assumptions or commitments, you know, in our budget, if some things were, you know, sort of, I guess, locked into or contractually, and we have our Mound Fire and our St. Bonnie Fire, which both had pretty, you know, modest increases there. Um, we have our labor contracts with, you know, our unions as well as our non-unions and, you know, we're estimating for the salaries and, you know, insurance and stuff about 70000 there. I referenced earlier the mid-year start of the staff police lieutenant and that's, um, you know, we've discussed that at the last several meetings. Um, our funding sources for our capital improvements, the payment management plan, and then uh, I think under um, staff reports we've scheduled out uh, later in the agenda meetings talking about um, the surface water, water, sewer, because those individual utility funds or enterprise funds are you know, separate from the, the tax levy funds or the, the general funds, so we'll be talking about those in October and November here. I guess, yeah, just to summarize what was in the packet, um, we want to improve the uh, resolution. I guess we got that under, under business items here in a minute um, by the, the deadline. Um, We've had multiple meetings, as Mike referenced, with um, both at the staff level and then staff and council. Um, I think we had a pretty good uh, consensus at that September 2nd meeting. Uh, basically, the main components of the increase are, are the roads, you know, it's about 2.6%, and then the uh, capital is about 1.5%. The general fund we pretty much kept flat by using some, you know, reserves and, and doing some, you know, saving where we could and, and that type of thing so um and then the last point is that um obviously this is the ceiling we're setting so um whatever the final budget you know can even still come up again you know at, at um between now and um one of the agenda items we'll set is the the public comment uh, date of um in december but um this is the maximum we're setting so uh it can be you know stay the same or be reduced but it can't be increased between now and um, when the final budget and levy are adopted so that's what I have for the presentation. So, uh, council okay. has any comments or any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. I think it looks
looks good. Okay, so otherwise, yeah, I guess we'll have consent agenda and we'll be back in a minute here to, <laughs> there's a few or action yeah. items that we have, so. Brian, I, I think one of the things that we have to do <clears throat> is in discussing the budget here, when we talk about a 4% increase uh, in real numbers, uh, you know, in real numbers, it's minimal. And I think we also have to show the fact, as you did on that slide, uh, for years and years, our taxes in Minatrista have increased year by year by year by year up until 2010. In 2010, as you showed in the slide, they started to go level out and actually go down. So what you're asking for right now with this increase, still with the increase, correct me if I'm wrong, but still with this increase, our taxes per resident, my tax that I'm paying to the city of Minatrista is still less than it was four years ago. Oh, is that correct? Yes, yeah, unless you had some major, the only people that wouldn't be able to say that is if they've moved in in the last four, yeah, you know, obviously they weren't here at that time, or if they did some major improvements to their, you know, property right, or something. Right, right, but like I mean, that. as but far as valuation goes, so. Board, yeah, I mean, if you just had your house and you still, you know, didn't make any major changes to it, yeah, I mean, they would, oh, so the vast majority are paying, yeah, less. If I didn't know how the taxes were calculated and I was a resident and all at once I seen somewhere, I seen in the paper that there's a 4% increase, I'm gonna go, what the heck, 4% increase. But in reality, I could live with that and I'd have no problem with that if I realized that in reality, in real numbers, it's probably zero, at most 2%, and still less than it was four years ago. Oh, it's less than it was in 2007. It's less than it was in 2000, I know up until a so point in time, years ago. It raised, it was, it taxes, my taxes went up every year. I've been living here for 20 years. My taxes have gone up until every year. And I didn't really notice a difference until about 2010 where it started to level off or go down. So the, the key is, and our job, is to communicate the whole story. I don't want another water issue thing where there was misinformation put out, information that wasn't correct or the rest of the story. I wanna make sure the information that we put out is accurate so we don't have this second guessing and all this misinformation that was printed in the paper and, mm -hmm. and other places that have been going around. That hurt us. Mm -hmm. We need the facts. We need the facts showed and how you did it and you did a great job here. I commend you on that because yeah. you showed the chart. Yeah, yeah. no, I, and that's from a staff perspective. I mean, I tried to, whoever, anyone I talk to, if they try to say my taxes are too high or whatever, <laughs> I pull out these slides and, or, you know, or different information and explain to them that our taxes have gone down and Sometimes if they try to, you know, the tax rate is different than the actual. I mean, this is real dollars. Right, so people right. Are paying so you understand what I mean. I seen in the paper at least six times five million dollars on the water treatment, which is a bunch of crap. We all know that it never was, but I seen it in the paper six times. I want to make sure that we're showing again here that the story is presented correctly. And that really, what does that mean? It still means I'm paying less than I did four years ago. Definitely yeah. more than four years ago. More than four years ago. So well, that's our important part that we need to communicate that to our residents and our taxpayers who are paying the bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, and one thing I always try to get across too <coughs> is that I think people sometimes mistake or misunderstand their total, we control basically about a quarter of the tax bill. Right, we you got the, the school, school, you got the county, and, you got everything and else. And the county, I mean the county is the largest. Well, we're watershed, talking about the so. city. Yeah, 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 our, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you look at when you get your actual statement that comes in November, look at uh, what you're paying for the city in comparison to the other ones and. No, we've done a great job, here. no question. And you did a good job of presenting yeah. that. Now we just have to get that to the public, yeah. to the taxpayer, and, like the and communicate that, that way. That you went over the values, because the one thing that our residents have told us over and over is that if we're going to do a tax increase, if it's about roads, they're okay with it. Yeah, yeah and that's been on too. And we're looking here that we're taking 100,000. We've got comments, and I've had comments, and I know the rest of us have had comments. The roads are in the best shape they've ever been, ever in Minatrista, but yet we still are gonna increase it by another $100,000 to even prove it better. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's had anything about the roads, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, we're doing what our people want, we're listening. And that's what we wanna get across. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so we'll pick that up again once we get to the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. So let's move along to the consent agenda. I do wanna remove the meeting minutes um, a and B, and um, there's just were a few things that need to be corrected. And can we bring them back to the next meeting? Yes, we can, Mayor. Okay. Anybody have anything else on the consent agenda they want to pull? No. No. All right. Um, so 
Entertain a motion. Motion to approve the consent agenda without item A and B. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Okay, now we're on to public hearings, which there are none. What the Planning Commission's discussion centered around was um, it's harder to change, you know, the ordinance like this all the time as opposed to the fee schedule, something you do every year. And they had concerns about, um, you know, actually charging people for something like that. So I um, wanted to more recommend that be in the fee schedule, um, which, again, is something we do every year. This has been a particular problem at Hunter's Crest. Correct. Oh. I think they did a good job on it. Do you guys have any suggestions or comments? Good job. Well, since I'll make a motion to approve it as written. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And so now we need to authorize publication Ordinance 420 by title and summary. So moved. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five all. Okay, number C, or letter C, accepting quote for the demolition of structures on the Gillespie property at 1420 Westwood Drive. Thanks again, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, as you may recall, we, the council has been exploring uh, several different areas in which uh, would be uh, the, the most uh, cost-effective method in removing the, st the structures on the Gillespie property that was donated to the city uh, for, park, for a public park purpose. Um, the last uh, method that we explored was uh, asking the Mound Fire Department if a controlled burn would be a viable option. Um, after their analysis of the site, they, can, they uh, uh, concluded that that this site would not be appropriate for them to do a controlled burn from from a safety standpoint and a number of other reasons um, that has led us to where we are today with a traditional uh, demolition of the structures that are on that site S uh, staff solicited quotes from three different vendors um, all of which who did submit uh, the quotes range with the high quote at uh, thirty nine thousand eight hundred dollars and a low quote from Pride Construction and Excavating at $17,500. Uh, staff is uh, looking uh, for a, a motion to adopt a resolution accepting the low quote uh, from Pride Construction and Excavating to do the demolition um, of the structures on the Gillespie property. And just from an update standpoint, um, we did get the uh, asbestos uh, surveyor uh, in, the, in the property Wednesday of last week, so the samples have been taken. They've been sent out uh, to the testing facility. We have not received the results back yet, uh, but that, that progress is in motion. And once we get the survey back, uh, we'll be looking to get quotes on uh, having a company actually get the asbestos out of the site before the demolition can occur. Okay, any questions? Looking for a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt a resolution accepting a quote from Pride Construction for demolition and removal of the Gillespie property. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I'm abstaining because it's a relative. Oh, okay. Four oh. One I would abstention. Want be, I wouldn't want to be accused of doing anything unethical. <laughs> okay. <then. laughs> All right. Now, number D is the approve the final sale of the 2014A bonds, refunding bond issues 2005A and 2007A. I believe this is Mr. Hagen. And Mr. Grimm. Yep, yeah. And Mr. Grimm. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah. Mr. Um, Grimm. Then, yeah. Mayor, members of the council, I'll introduce uh, Todd Hagen from our, um, our financial consultant, Ellers and Associates. He'll he be here to talk about. I think everyone's got one of these at mm -hmm. their yep. desk, so that's the main thing we'll be talking off of there is um, versus the information that's in the packet. This is updated for the, uh, the bid results and the um, really good s savings we got on this issue, and I'll let, uh, I guess, Todd uh, talk on the, uh, the details Thanks, of the report. Brian. Great. Yeah, don't take the wind out of my sails. Yep, yep. <laughs> I, I see it's sunny out behind me now, so it's good. Yeah. Uh, it was a great day to sell bonds today. Um, again, Todd Hagen from Ellers & Associates. You're uh, bond consultant at a beautiful downtown Roseville. Um, you know, today uh, by t uh, up to 10 o'clock, we received bids on these refinancing bonds. Um, I was here on uh, or 
Becky was here on July 21st to set this bond sale up uh, to come back with bids for today. Um, we are refinancing a 2005 A bond and a 2007 A bond for an interest cost savings. So we're keeping the term the same and uh, not extending uh, anything uh, or, uh, or shortening up the bond issue, just basically apples to apples on this because the market is so good uh, to sell bonds. We want you folks to uh, enjoy those savings. And I think you did today. Um, we received six bids kind of to cut to the chase here as far as the bond issue is concerned. Um, we're happy with the six bids. Uh, if you look in a couple pages in, you'll see the, uh, how the bidding came, came out. Um, the winning bid was uh, City Securities Corporation out of Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and that came in at a 1.8493 uh, true interest rate. Um, the second bid, uh, the cover bid, second to the best bid was at Bayard out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, at 1.97%, and then United Bankers Bank out of Bloomington, uh, local here at 2.02%, and Northland Securities out of Minneapolis, again local at 2.17%. Uh, uh, the next one is Raymond James and Associates out of St. Petersburg, Florida. I think uh, Brandon and I talked that they had purchased some of your bonds in the past. Um, didn't win this one, 2.35%, um, but appreciate their participation. And a place called Bosk Incorporated out of Dallas, Texas at 2.53%. Uh, so if you kind of put that into an interest difference uh, by bidding this out um, and not just going with one, and it might have been the the last bid there, you, you know, you're sort of saving a little over $46,000 there too by, by bidding out the, the project itself. So we wouldn't know who, who was all interested in it if we didn't go out for bids. So uh, kudos to the council to go uh, and send this out because it's a pretty vanilla deal out in the market and it's uh, with your fantastic AA plus rating and uh, with a stable outlook. Uh, that really attracted some bids from, you know, out state, obviously. So it was neat to see uh, six bids. And that's a lot of bids, you know, considered in this market. Um, so before we get to the rating part, um, we had the ability to adjust the bond issue today, too. Um, that best bid uh, gave us uh, interest rate uh, that actually is higher than the reoffering yield. And we talked about a premium bid. Uh, before, so they did offer premium bid, um, and you can see the reoffering yield is lower than the rate. Uh, what they did is gave us more money, um, actually almost eighty thousand dollars more than we needed. We don't need any more than we need on a refunding bond, uh, and they didn't really take any uh, discount or, or basically any fee. So in exchange for a little higher interest rate, uh, we actually lowered the bond issue. Uh, by about $165,000, and that includes some prepaid special assessments that Brian and I talked about this morning um, that have kind of accumulated, I think, in the 2007A um, debt account, and this is a good time to shake that tree and, and use those, you know, put, those, put that cash to work, basically, uh, at this point. So when you add up um, the cash contribution from the city uh, and some, you know, no fee basically for the underwriter and they gave us more money than we needed and the cost of issuance yes went down at least 2400 bucks um, and i'm sure that was us uh, that when you add all that up and subtract it uh, we lowered the bond 165 thousand dollars so it's not a million 245 anymore it's a million eighty so and that basically equated to a higher uh, savings overall instead of seventy four thousand dollars and some change overall uh, over the life of the bond issue, it's a little over $100,000 now. So it's nice to break that $100,000 mark. And um, so that, that helped uh, considerably in the bond issue. So I think basically, too, you followed the market. Because if you look at the bond buyer trend uh, between then and now, it's gone down about 14 basis points. And that's really what your, your true interest cost reflected was like 15 basis points. So, you know, you're, you're striking while the iron's hot here and the rates have been going down, and, and that's great because we don't know, you know when they're going to go up, when and if they're going to. But uh, Crystal Ball says they're probably going to go up sooner or later. How's that for being specific? <laughs> so that, that was, a, it was a great great bond sale, and that's sort of how we adjusted it. I mean, the closing is September 11th, 
and you know we take care of calling in the old bonds and uh, substituting uh, these for the new ones. So we had a really, uh, really good rating call a week ago today at about three o'clock with Mike and Brian on the phone and a couple representatives from Standard and Poor's. Um, I was on the phone and Becky from Ellers and Associates uh, were on the phone as well. And it was about, I don't know, 45 minute to an hour conference call, but we do load them up with as much information ahead of time as possible in order to you know, minimize the questions on the rating call. And, and it really uh, was, uh, it really tracked their new methodology and criteria that they put into play after year two bond issues for, you know, the roundabout and, and Kings Point Road there. So we really didn't know what we were going to get um, as far as a, a bond rating. Um, but you're, you know, one notch below a AAA already. I mean, you basically have the same rating the state of Minnesota has. So you're a double A plus and, and you're right at the top. And you did stay there uh, to cut to the chase on that. You're a double A plus stable uh, rating. Uh, if you look at the report, there are some bullet points that just sort of summarize, um, summarize how this played out. Uh, you have a, a very strong economy with you know, Minneapolis and St. Paul being right around the corner here. Uh, very strong budgetary flexibility, very strong liquidity, um, providing very strong cash levels, strong management conditions. Uh, adequate budgetary performance and, and you've got some weak debt and contingent liability positions. I think that's what's keeping you down from a triple A. But it's really nice getting on a rating call with, you know, strong financial management in the city of Minnetrist. It's really fun to, to talk to these, these folks and kind of talk about the lake area, the western Hennepin uh, County kind of economy, which is, you know, starting to kind of obviously pick up before the rest of the uh, metro area is. And, um, uh, in high income levels and things like that, but you know you with the growing community you also have you know more more bonds to issue you know and and that's sort of going to keep you down probably from that one notch triple uh, until uh, until some of those bonds drop off <clears throat> and or it doesn't hurt to refinance them either you know so uh, we do what we can um, in that in that regard so you are um, you know if you look at uh, they do hint a little bit in the in the report itself and you know what does very strong mean you know when you look at, at this and you can read the paragraphs in between the lines but you know very strong economy that, that's that's really the highest level you can get very strong budgetary flexibility is, is the highest they they give you very strong liquidity um, and that's really uh, really available cash you know and that's the highest um, highest they can give you um, I mean, to back up to the budgetary flexibility, uh, that's, you know, that's basically, um, you know, your general fund balance is what, the, is what that is. So flexibility and liquidity, those are indications of how much money you folks have set aside, <clears throat> which offsets, obviously, uh, any of the, any of the, 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 lower, the lower scales here. Um, adequate budgetary performance, uh, that's in the middle, you know, that's right in the middle. Uh, it's probably a maybe, maybe you know I, I don't work for Standard and Poor's, but it might be a three, you know, and and a one's the best, right? And the five's probably the worst. So it's, it's a scale from one to five. So you know probably maybe a three. You're right in the middle there, and that's basically kind of how you operate uh, throughout the year, you know. And they don't subtract, you know, for one-time capital expenditures, things that are unforeseen like that, planned a little bit. But you know if you have a capital outlay, that's a one-time snapshot it's not a it's not a you know a penalty um, but that really is kind of the roadmap of you know some of the takeaway from here is just how how you operate um, you know throughout throughout the year and I think that's what they mean by perf budgetary performance uh, management conditions uh, strong means you know almost the highest so you're you know you're probably almost a number one there and uh, and then basically the strong institutional framework, that's just the city of Minnetrista being in the state of Minnesota, which is different than other states. Um, and you have you know, different opportunities here uh, than other states and it's for populations greater than 2,500 people. So you know, not a lot you can do about the economy and not a lot you can do about the institutional framework. Uh, that is, is what it is. So yeah, it was a great uh, bond sell. I just wanted to summarize that, you know, we don't have Standard & Poor's coming over here every day to, you know, review their report and I just do the, try to do the best we can to interpret what, what they've got 
Um, you know, they're out of Chicago. They, they put this stuff in a, in a machine. They have a committee. They talk about you. They try to get as much positives to offset any negatives as they can, and they don't want to set you up for a fall <coughs> either. So it's, uh, that's a great rating, and it was a great bond sale. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if the, the action would be to pass the resolution, uh, bond resolution, um, from Kennedy and Graven, if you don't have any questions, but I'm here for questions too, if you folks have any. Mm -hmm. so. Any yeah. questions? Yeah, so just one thing that, as Todd noted, so the resolution that was in your packet had the 1245000 That's been lowered based on those items. Okay. You know, he referenced to 80000 So I guess, yeah, the action would be the res resolution authorizing mm -hmm. issuance, awarding the sale, prescribing the form and details, and providing for the payment of 1080000 general obligation refunding bond series 2014A. So moved. Second. Did you have a question? Do we need to do a public hearing? No. 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 I think we should be very proud of the fact that we're one not short of a triple A rating. I think that's due to our good staff. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And Brian, our awesome finance director. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I had a hat, I'd take it off to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a team effort. So. Yeah. Well, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I get a quick signature from? Yes. Madam. <coughs> okay. And then same place. Yeah. More signature pages to come. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, so Todd. much for the business and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we're going to do the adopt the reimbursement resolution regarding the water treatment plant project. Oh, it's Madam Mayor and Council. I'll take that one. Also, this um, item is on uh, pages 167 to 160 or 165 to 167 of your packet. Um, this came um, about just you know with the, uh, the water treatment plant project moving forward. Um, we do have a reimbursement resolution that's on file, but I think it's it's good to update every so often, and especially with a more specific um, project you know like like this. So um, what's attached in your um, in the packet on pages 166 and 167 is a uh, resolution that we prepared um, with the help of uh, our bond council Kenny and Graven that uh, basically. Uh, allows us the uh, ability to uh, reimburse ourselves through and we're planning to use the Minnesota PFA loan process and we'll know about, more about that in the uh, coming month or so here but um, right now our ex estimated maximum principal amount is about 16 million that um, can be changed as we move along in the process but um, we just need, uh, need to have this adopted um, and have this on file so we uh, make sure we reserve the right to reimburse ourselves for, for the project so in, in an event that we're bonded by the state correct. and we've already spent the dollars correct yes yes okay any questions mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion I'll make a motion to adopt the reimbursement resolution regarding the water treatment plant project I'll second it all those in favor aye aye, aye. Five -oh. okay our next item is claims Did we change kennel providers? Uh, <clears throat> Madam Mayor, members of the council, no, we have not. Okay. I just didn't remember J.P. Cook. It says kennel charges. I would have oh, to. It's on uh, page mm -hmm. 171. Usually I think that's cross -rate. Yeah. Yeah, I just I didn't recognize the J.P. Cook. Uh, J.P. Cook is not the uh, the kennel that we use. I, I don't know why that name is on there. It must be some reference. It's a that's the dog license. I think is the might be the name that it was put under. I'm not sure. I'd have to research that. Yeah. Okay. But Maybe we still use the same kennel services. That could be purchasing of new dog licenses. 
and the number, uh, yeah, the finance number <coughs> comes up as kennel charges. Oh, I don't know, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It's in the same category, it's all the dog related, yeah. but it might possibly be the supplies that we yeah. use to issue dog licenses. Yeah. That might be oh, the name of the company, it. that's yeah. probably what it and is. And it probably yeah. just comes out of the kennel charge uh, right. line, line item, item in the budget, there. okay, would be my best guess without okay. researching it. That was my only question. Mm -hmm. I have a question about check number 056295 to Oconia Ford Mercury. Um, I know in the CIP plan there was a talk about a truck for a public works. Yeah. And I see here we have spent $38,959 for a 205, 2015 Ford Super Duty truck. When was this authorized? It was originally in the 2014 um, budget, and then we also had on, on the, uh, the uh, last meeting, we had the, uh, the um, on the consent agenda, we had the, to amend the public works CIP. We had sold the grader for right, 100,000 right. more than, um, for 20,000 more, for 120,000 versus 100. So this was on one of the items on that list of, of that uh, agenda item was to, uh, I think originally public works had budgeted for uh, a truck that was less than the thirty-eight thousand, but they found that it wasn't what they really, you know, needed. So with that extra funds, they're just pretty much taking that money from the greater sale and applying it. To, and they had a list of items that was at that last uh, council meeting. So that's this was one of those items on that list. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Sure. Look for a motion. Motion to approve the claims. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, council reports. Um, we are going to meet with uh, Dr. Byer tomorrow. Correct. To discuss uh, possibly using the WRA park as a potential water treatment plant site. That's my only update. Mark? I have none. Arlene? I have nothing. Bob? Uh, in going and, and, and looking at the WRA with the possibility of a water plant, I have to get a little closer here. Mm -hmm. Looking at the WRA for the uh, water, centralized water plant, I know the location would be really good. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, I think we need to look at the property that the city purchased four or five years ago. I think there's enough property here that we could take a look and see if it's more workable to put it on the city property here uh, versus at WRA. I just don't believe, based on what I know about the WRA, and obviously, as you know, I've been extremely large supporters of that for years. I think we're going to have to take a look at it. We can meet with Dr. Byron, but I think that's going to be a dead issue. Okay. Well, the second selection for a site was mm -hmm. this campus. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of the funding for WRA is handled by my family, so okay. I don't think that's going to happen. Would it affect the, uh, I don't think we thought it would affect what goes on there. It would be on the back end. Yeah, no, I, I understand, but I, I think we, uh, it would be highly controversial. I, I would really like to take a look at, look at, at some of the property that the city owns that was purchased <coughs> back when the facilities were built, the public safety building and the a building that was work. I think it's from a central standpoint, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be feasible to do. There's enough land to do it. Am I, am I correct in saying that? I think there's probably enough land at either side. I don't think it's the size of, of that, the land that we're looking at. I think when we have our meeting tomorrow um, and then when uh, uh, Bowman make is they're going to do soil borings. I mean, I think a lot of it may be determined for us by what we get as results, so. Okay. But yeah, I, I wonder, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to throw mud on it here. I'm just mm -hmm. letting you know that I think that's going to be an uphill battle going with WRA. Okay. All right. Um, so now it's, uh, and Tyler. No updates. Any updates? Okay. Staff reports? Uh, just a few things to talk about. Kind of um, heard, it, heard it brought up a couple of times. We did have a... Uh, kickoff meeting on October 8th with members of Bolton Make, WSB, and city staff, and uh, city council member. 
um, Mayor Hunt being there. Um, the, the purpose of the meeting on the 8th of August was to kind of talk, talk about the overall scope of the uh, water treatment project. Um, as you heard, there's a couple of sites that are under consideration. Um, that's to be determined. Um, the other things we talked about were well, where we might have, have to uh, put the, the, or figure out the routes for the piping, size and scale of the actual water plant, um, a funding uh, mechanism and schedules. Um, and then I did hear from, uh, didn't talk, we traded voicemails. Um, uh, Seth Peterson and I today spoke. Um, and we're gonna try to probably uh, have another meeting, I think not next week, but the week after. So um, so to be determined on the, on the next meeting from this uh, group. So it was a good, good kickoff meeting. And so we're, we're, they gave a lay a lot of groundwork here and kind of where we're gonna go. Enchanted Lane. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Um, we did talk about this at the previous meeting, but I thought maybe the best way to go about this is put this in a memo in a staff report, but at least in the process and looking at, um, number one is removing the temporary roadway um, that's out there today. And I think I loosely said we want to get that done before it frees up. Obviously, I'd like to get that done much sooner than that. Uh, we are contacting contractors to try to drum up some interest. Um, the thing with the contractors, we need to make sure they have access to trucks and that they have equipment to remove the rock. Uh, and we have to find some of those that are interested in actually doing the work. Uh, that's been one of the biggest tasks. I know there's two of them for sure that are interested. So I have those on my list already. Um, and I'm looking for others. Um, the, uh, so after we get the rock removed, then we have to t go through and take a look at what the pavement condition is underneath it. And that'll determine whether or not we can just go out and patch it and I'll say limp it through the winter um, and then maybe readdress it in the spring uh, after or during pothole season. And then maybe some of those dollars that we have set aside for, from FEMA to try to address some of these road repairs, we can apply that to, our, to a permanent fix so there may be some money we can offset there to do that. Um, and then look at um, here over the uh, late fall, early winter, uh, look at the feasibility and so forth of making permanent repairs in the floodplain. And if we, and the council wants us to look at the entire project with Shorewood from border to border and beyond, uh, we'll do that as well. We'll work with Shorewood to do that. So that's a synopsis of how we're approaching the project. And uh, we do hope to have a quote package out here in the next week. So is this something that our public works can help with? We did talk about that. Uh, right now they've got so many things going on, uh, they did not think that their staff could handle it. Okay. Uh, one of the difficulties with this project is once they start, they need to keep moving. Right. And trying to do it in an efficient manner. We did talk about even, I believe one of the residents, I think Mr. Grote may have even mentioned that um, taking it off at night to disturb as little traffic as possible. There's a lot of traffic that goes through there. And we know. And in order to try, you know, once the contract is <coughs> working, it's going to pull traffic back uh, while they can load a few trucks and then back drag the material so we can ramp it so cars can get up and get out. Um, or do we look at working with the neighbors adjacent to each of these zones and do it at night? Uh, there'd be a noise issue there, but, but less traffic. If you have a preference, I'd certainly like to know what your thoughts are on that. Um, well, what do the neighbors think? Well, I think I've had at least one say that maybe nighttime would be a good time to do it. Uh, I, my preference would be like <coughs> to be able to look at it during the daytime. So if something does go awry, we have public works on staff uh, that can, can help address some issues. We have engineering on staff that can address issues. Um, so for me, doing it during the day is probably a better alternative and then less disturbing to the neighbors at night. Mm. And then we keep the rock, right? Correct. Public Works wants the rock. Um, they have, they definitely have the areas they can use that rock. Okay. Any other questions? Mm. Okay. Yeah, I would add to that if you do have some local contractors that you're aware of that also have, may have an interest and fit that criteria and certainly send that information to me and I'll make sure a quote package will be sent out to them. Do you have any idea how much this is going to cost? I do not. It's really going to be trucking costs and it's going to be hourly by the truck. What we do is we'd set up a contract 
by the cubic yard you know, so that we can track how many loads go out. Uh, we don't have to scale, have a scale on hand uh, to, to um, weigh the trucks. So I think it's just better to come up with an average volume of each truck that's going to be hauling and have it hauled out by the cubic yard, paying by the cubic yard, <coughs> not worry about the time and materials side of it, but so they'd be hauling it off the island and then delivering it here to Public Works. Would this be included in the cost of repair that FEMA would cover? Just uh, so we're perfectly clear, at this point FEMA has not included Hennepin County in the declaration. That process is going much slower than, than we had anticipated, so I'm just pushing forward the information that I have. But at this point they have not been included and we've been told and told and told that they believe that is going to happen. Um, however, that uh, dollar amount keeps moving around. We've, we've provided our preliminary damage assessments numbers to the county to forward uh, to FEMA. With that said, we don't have a total because Enchanted Lane is by far our most expensive piece and we can't guess and therefore those numbers have not been included because we won't know the, the extent of the damage until that rock is removed. Um, so certainly if they have not made a declaration or a decision one way or the other, by the time we get the rock removed, we'll be able to push that information forward to them. Unfortunately, they may or may not make that decision prior to getting that rock off of there, but I'll certainly keep you posted. We're hopeful that they will make that declaration, in which case uh, a lot of the expense, the damage would be reimbursed through the state and federal governments, but uh, if they don't, then that'll be a different issue, but I'll, I'll keep you posted when that information becomes available. Mike, would we need to do another one of those intent to reimburse for this project if it's going to take a while? We could. I don't know if that's, that's a uh, good idea. Yeah. Could bring something back. Bring that back on this. Yeah. 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 Just so that we have the ability to move it along. Oh, well. that's true. Yeah. Bigger decisions are. Right. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. The main thing would be whether if whether or not we're going to need to. Uh, Sell, sell bonds. For yeah, them. I mean, that's a bond concept. Oh, okay. So unless we're selling bonds. Sure. Yeah, okay. we're really probably not going to sell a bond. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, but is there any other kind of resolution you have to do so that you can be reimbursed? That's not bond, but... Okay, right. you, you think we're good? Think we can well, I don't, I don't know, uh, Madam Mayor, I don't know what the FEMA requirements are, but... Other than, I mean, the, the reimbursement, the type of reimbursement resolution you adopted tonight for the water treatment right. plant doesn't make any sense in, in this context. I know, but is there something that we have to do so that we, other than keep track of our costs and submit them to FEMA, is there any other form or process that we need to be aware of? Um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, the short answer to that is no. We have, I've already documented what we have to date as well as uh, with, along with public works. Gary has been, uh, I guess, instrumental in getting me a lot of those costs. So I'm working closely with him. That data has already been turned over to FEMA in a kind of a preliminary sense. Um, it's being used now to make a, collectively make a decision as to whether or not Hennepin County will be included in that declaration. If they are, then essentially that process will start over in a very detailed fashion and then we'll be able to recoup those costs through that process. And so. I will work through that process step by step it, once that declaration is made. So we're already in, in, in line for that to, to occur once they make the declaration. If they don't make it, then at that point we're, there won't be any reimbursement. But uh, I'm being told that they're hopeful that that will happen. So uh, I'm Great. remaining optimistic. Okay. You, Paul, do you know what Shorewood's got in mind? I think they're waiting to see what we do. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say it that way. What they're going to do is they, they hauled out a lot of uh, bituminous millings, and I believe they're going to take pull out that material off the roadway. Uh, they're more interested in long-term, um, looking at the long-term solution, so we don't have to keep doing this. Okay. So, I think we are, too. Yeah, yeah. so they, they took care of their own. They yeah. hauled it out themselves. Yes. Okay. So but they didn't have the extent that we did. No, no. I just thought if we were going to do it, and if they were looking for a contractor, if you get one contractor between both mm -hmm. cities, you might get a little bit better discount. And yeah. I think their impact was a lot lower than yeah. ours were, so they handled it in their public works department. Okay. All right, I guess our next item is the stormwater drainage priorities. 
at the last uh, at the last meeting, um, uh, council asked me to take a look at the priorities of the stormwater items that I uh, prepared in a map mm -hmm. format. Um, the ones that I had on that, the items I had on that map, there were 10 items. I actually added another one, um, but, you were, but you were aware of it. And that's one of those that we'll have to take care of here in 2014. Um, that was the, on the, if you look back to the map number 11, is that South Bay Drive sewer washout that we had. Right. Yeah, we are um, also working on a package to put that back together. I think the last update I gave you is that um, does not need to meet the, the criteria for a dam. That helps us out tremendously. It reduces the amount of design. I do have somebody taking a look at what we need to do in there to pack that material back in there so it doesn't do this again. Although, keep in mind, it was under some extreme conditions. But I understand from Public Works, we have had some erosion issues in that area before. So we want to try to reduce that. Uh, there is a temporary pumping station that is, uh, um, is a bypass uh, pump for that section of sewer now. And we need to have that out of there, um, obviously, before freeze up. And we plan to have this one as well taken care of before that. Right now, we do not have an estimate of cost, but we are putting together a bid package to get that out for quotes. Um, most of the, these, were, I thought, were fairly high priority, and that's why we put them on the list. Uh, so we did look at taking care of these between the fall of 2014 and the end of 2016, at least in a in a format where we can look at it and look at alternatives, where the council, council can decide whether we should go forward with them or not. Uh, I tried to break them up too uh, on the <coughs> in categories such as uh, localized flooding uh, for property and or structure. So Enchanted Lane is obviously the highest priority one on there. Um, the second one, uh, looking at the Morning View Drive, this is uh, the Hoffman drainage problem we already looked at, we looked at and we should be bringing back some alternatives for you yet here in the next month. Mm -hmm. So that is progressing. Uh, there's also a very similar situation up on Hard Scrabble Circle. Uh, that uh, property owner that contacted us there, that's the Georgi family, and it's very similar to the Hoffman. I mean, just put a brief description for you on each one of those so you, so you know what they are. And then uh, there was Mr. Hosmer was in on the Jennings Cove Pond. Uh, that's another one we look at trying to resolve here in 2015. And then there's also another property owner, uh, Mr. Engel, we met down on Halstead Avenue. That's a, there's an area there that is, I believe, zoned for multiple family or townhomes, uh, higher density. Um, it's vacant land, but there's quite a bit of water that's going down through the property there are very tight um, uh, corridors between the houses and I believe in this last at least this last June there was they did experience some water in, there, in the structure through the garage and in the house so that was one that I also think we have to take a, a look at between uh, 2015 and 2016. We looked at some erosion issues uh, the South Bay Drive washout and I, and I think there were some photos that I sent out uh, or that uh, uh, Mike had sent out to, to each of you. Um, that one is probably with the, the worst one, the highest priority, especially because there's a sanitary sewer involved in that one. Uh, another one is the Trillium Bay stormwater outfall. Um, if any of you had a chance to go down and take a look at that, there's a good volume of material that got washed down the side slope. It's not, in my opinion, it's not affecting any structures nearby, but the longer we leave that, the, more, the worse that erosion is going to that one has a very difficult access. Um, it's it's going to be it's not going to be an easy project to uh, repair. Uh, the game farm road uh, erosion that was the there's a horse trail along the roadway that um, we are working with the property owner to try to maybe regrade and redirect some water so that uh, it doesn't go down the horse trail and wash it out. And it's happened repeatedly. We also looked at some storm sewer and culvert repairs. There's, a, um, again, a morning view drive. There's a storm sewer pipe that needs to be, um, is basically collapsing on itself. Uh, there's a, the storm sewer in the street and then goes through to, uh, between properties. And that really needs to be replaced. We looked at lining it. And it doesn't look like lining will be a, a good solution. There's also the Loring Acres stormwater um, pond, the outlet for that. There's, a, a, again, some storm sewer pipe that that one might be able to be lined. It was uh, plugged. I think Public Works spent a few weeks trying to get that one cleared. Mm -hmm. We were able to do that, so it's, it's working in a, in a maintained fashion, but that one likely will be lined. 
And then the um, Highway 7, Marywood Lane, Pond Outlet, we did talk about this one a little bit, but that one is going to be a MnDOT issue, so that one's really off the list. Can I ask you about uh, going back to erosion on 44? Um, is Hennepin County taking care of that, do you know? Um, they've taken some temporary measures. They still have some things to do out there. I don't know what their status is on, on getting that complete, but that's Hennepin County that would be do, doing that work. Okay. But the, you haven't heard anything? No. Okay. The, the one on Highway 7 in Marywood, what happened there? It looks like what may have happened is there may have been some, uh, there's a, an old uh, corrugated metal pipe underneath Highway 7. And the, there was a connection point that wasn't very good on uh, underneath the turn lane. And I don't know what the circumstances were behind it. It looks like the water that discharged through that corrugated pipe flowed outside the, the new storm sewer and came out and washed out the mm -hmm. material along the uh, structure in the pond. So basically, when you looked at the when you looked at the outlet structure for the pond, there was no soil around it. It just looked like a tower in the middle of the bank. So uh, Public Works has packed that material back in, and then MnDOT was to address the, that connection there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Reminder of upcoming meetings, is that you, Mike? Yeah, I get to talk about one thing tonight. I haven't had many things on the agenda that have been just me. Um, we do have our next council meeting scheduled uh, day after when it normally would be held. Um, Monday, September 1st is Labor Day and city offices are closed and it's a holiday. So our next meeting is on Tuesday, September 2nd. And then we'll be back on schedule with that second meeting in September on Monday the 15th. So the Tuesday the 2nd and Monday the 15th for our next two meetings. Great. 5.30 for a work session and seven o'clock regular meeting for both. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? I don't think so. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. And second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This meeting is adjourned. Okay, I got some more.